speaker. We're really excited to be able to announce Mike McCowitz. Mike McCowitz is an author of the book Profit First, which as you see, we've been pushing very heavily a concept that we feel like is really helpful, especially in our industry where we can be squeezed from the top and the bottom. Um, also written The Pumpkin Plan, The Surge, and his newest release, which we touched on a little bit, Clockwork. And Mike's also founded, sold two companies to PE and to a Fortune 500 company. Um, he's helped contribute to Wall Street Journal, MSNBC, and just an overall super nice guy. So I'm super really excited. Come on in, Mike McCollins. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Appreciate So, um, is anyone here from the Northeast? Like, all right. What's up with the pizza? I, uh, Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. No, no, it's not as bad. I just, I walked in, I'm a little bit hungry. I'm like, I have a slice of pizza. I'm from the New York area, New Jersey. And I'm like, who comes a pizza like this? It's supposed to be a slice of pizza and there's like a thousand squares. I got, I'm, I got so confused. I'm like, I think I'm done. I'm out. I'm out. Um, and uh, I think what we're going to talk about today is profitability. Uh, you may feel the same way. I, I'm going to present it in a way maybe you haven't heard of before. Maybe it's going to be spiced up a different way. So if you feel like, I'm out, I don't get it, just bear with me. The pizza is, I thought it was actually pretty good. I did have one little square. Um, the, the thing I'm going to teach you today will bring permanent profitability to your business. Actually, I'm convinced of it if you do it. Hey, have you ever been told something that is a total freaking lie, even though the person telling you this thinks it's in your best interest to hear this? Has he ever been told a total lie? And your friend's like, oh yeah, this is true. Um, you ever believe in the tooth fairy if you didn't raise your hand? Um, any tooth fairy? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was a total tooth fairy believer. I grew up in the 70s. My, uh, my mother told me, uh, that was the, the stranger equals danger generation in the 70s, right? And my mother said, whatever you do, never get near a stranger. In fact, I was a latchkey kid. Get home, lock the door, you know, just don't answer the door, don't answer the phone, unless it's my mom, hide away. She goes, but there's one stranger who will, in the middle of the night, I was five years old, in the middle of the night will tiptoe into your room, it's this woman, she'll crawl into bed with you, steal a body part, and then give you some hush money not to talk about it. And, uh, so that kind of confused me with the stranger equals danger kind of mindset. We are often told things that the person telling us believes it's our best interest, that it'll help us, when in fact it's actually not the truth whatsoever. This, this becomes what's called an axiom, an established belief, a belief that perpetuates through society. Now what I just told you with myth, was mythology. Um, so if you still believe in the tooth fairy, sorry. It's a myth. Um, but there's also perceived beliefs just throughout society that stay with society. In fact, it was around 500 BC that mankind, humankind, thought the world was flat. And if you remember history class, like third grade, they had pictures of world maps, pretending this was one of them. In the corners were like you know, sea serpents and, and monsters, specifically there to dissuade sailors from going too far out in the ocean for the fear of falling off the edge of the planet. And um, society believed it. It actually crushed commerce. If, if you were in Europe, say in Italy, you would sail your boat along the coast of Italy to trade with other cities, but you would never circumnavigate the world, to the new world, where the riches were. And uh, this notion was challenged around 500 BC. Greek philosophers, as the story goes, uh, discovered the world was round. There was a master philosopher uh, sitting outside a port, looking at boats go in and out of the port. He was sitting there with his apprentice, and the master philosopher was like eating a, you know, a pear or something. There was a brown spot on it. He's about to bite into the pear, and he notices his brown spot, so he turns the pear, and the brown spot disappears from his vision. He looks out at the port as boats come in and out with his apprentice, and notices as a, port, as a boat goes out of port, it starts to sink down below the horizon. As a return, it comes back into the horizon. He turns his pear, he looks at the boats, and that was the moment of the epiphany. The, the master philosopher says to his apprentice, do you realize the significance of this? And you know, the apprentice very dutifully says, clearly, master, the teachings are wrong. The world is not flat. It is round. And the master philosopher looks at the apprentice and says, do I have to teach you everything, you idiot? The world is not round. It's shaped like a pear. <laughs> Thank you. That's the best joke I got. <laughs> That's about as good as, as Chicago pizza. Okay. Oh, oh, this guy's a jerk. 
Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about a different axiom today. Something, something that I believe is crushing almost every business on this planet, every small business. I suspect many people in this room are affected by this axiom too. There's a foundational formula we've all been told. It's an axiom. It perpetuates through society, and this is what it is. We, are, we have been told that sales minus expenses equals profit. And we don't, even know that, we don't even need to do a show of hands. I know every person in this room is familiar with this formula. It's foundational. It's taught in every accounting book um, that I've read. There's, there's thousands of books out there regarding the subject. Uh, it's in our common vernacular. As an entrepreneur, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the words for profit as bottom line or year end, right? It comes at the end. Well, there's a problem with this formula and there's a problem with this axiom because what it tells us, well, it makes logical sense, right? You have to have sales, you gotta sell your products, you, uh, you gotta you know, do the work to do, you gotta do the printing and so forth, and what's left over is profit. It makes logical sense, but the problem is it doesn't make behavioral sense. You see, it's human nature, when something comes last, it means it's insignificant. Like, would you ever say, you know, starting today, I'm going to put my family last. Probably not, unless you can't stand them. Um, right? yeah. Probably not, but when you say you put something last, it means I don't care. You, you say you were rushed to the hospital today and you had a health scare, and the doctor says you have to, you know, stop drinking, stop smoking, whatever. Did you come out of the hospital and say, you know what, I better start putting my health last? Of course not. I don't put my health first. It is wired into humanity, into us, that when something comes first, it is the priority. When something comes last, it's insignificant. It's the manana syndrome. I, myself, uh, Bruce was kind enough to share, I've grown some businesses, but I lived by this formula. I was in the technology space, computer systems and so forth. As I ran those businesses, something I've conveniently left off my resume, is they were never profitable. It was a hand-to-mouth situation. I was surviving check by check. I remember, Oh, I guess it was uh, five years into my first business of just getting by, not taking a salary, paying my employees by refinancing my home, loathing my business. I hated my business. But I remember after five years, I met with my accountant, Keith. He says, Mike, we've got great news to share with you. I know it's been five tough years, but you have a profit. And I was like, yeah. He circled a number on my income statement and said $15,000. And I felt the butterflies building up like, this is amazing. Profit. Five years of effort. And then I asked him a question I regret. I said, Keith, where is that profit? <laughs> Thank you for participating. Because uh, he laughed too. I don't know if you realize this, how accountants laugh. They don't laugh like normal people. They laugh and start snorting. You know, he's like, oh, I had 15,000. <laughs> you already, <laughs> you already spent all that money. It's gone. It's an accounting profit. What we're gonna talk about today is how I think most of us define profit, cold, hard cash. I'm gonna show you a process to ensure cold, hard cash in your bank for you to take out as a bonus when you want to. Accounting profits can be manipulated. Enron is a perfect example. They were profitable until the day 100,000 people got kicked out the door, whatever the number was. So we're gonna talk about cash profit. The way to do it is through a new formula. And uh, let me just move this here so it's visible to all of us. Um, the new formula I want to show you is this. That sales minus profit equals expenses. And what you'll notice right away is it's the same variables. It's actually, if you're familiar with some uh, fundamental math principles, this is mathematically the same. Logically, this is the identical formula. It's called a variable swap. We took profit, moved it up, took expenses, moved it down. We swapped the variable, so profit's not a plus, it's a minus. But it's identical. Logically, this behaves the same way. But the significant difference is the behavior, because now profit comes first. And in execution, what I'm suggesting we start doing today is every time a sale comes into your business for $173 per transaction or $17,000, it doesn't matter what it is, we're gonna take a predetermined percentage of that profit, allocate it toward an account, a cash account, hide that money away, and this will tell us what we actually have to run our business off of, the remainder. I, you can probably already tell from my energy that A, I'm from New Jersey, um, 
Oh, someone else from Jersey? Yeah. Right, on. Right, on. Northern Jersey? Yeah. Oh, Wayne. Okay, Route 23. Yeah, okay. Um, what an exit, exactly. Exit 12 of the turn thing. <laughs> Kim, 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 everyone's not from Jersey, very Kim. So I, started, I built these couple businesses uh, living by this formula, but I want to tell just a little bit about my story first of why I'm so passionate about this, why this brings me so much energy. Um, there was a study conducted by the SBA, Small Business Administration, identified of the 28 million small businesses in the U.S. Small business, by the way, defined by the SBA as a company that does $25 million in annual revenue or less. That's my business. I suspect it's many people's businesses in this room. The majority of us are defined as small business. And of the 28 million, 83% are surviving check by check. 83% of small business are hand to mouth. They don't have enough money to pay rent, payroll, well, and pay ourselves unless we have significant sales today. So it's constant sell, sell, sell. This study went on to become a global study. There's 180 million of us entrepreneurs globally, small business owners. Same percentage, 83% of businesses globally are in a stagnation in profitability, surviving, barely getting by. And uh, it hit home with me because that's how my businesses were. While I had grown these two businesses, I never made money running them. My first business I did sell to private equity. Um, if, if it, that was a new term to me when I sold it. It just means rich people. <laughs> and, uh, I, listen, I didn't make huge amounts of money. I didn't make, like, make FU money, but I did make some F me money. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what that means, but Jersey makes sense. And, um, and I said, oh, okay, that means, this formula means stick it out. Can, can you stick into, stay in business for five or 10 years? If you grind and hustle long enough, maybe, maybe the end of the rainbow, the miserable, dark, muddy, horrible rainbow, there'll be profit. So I said, I gotta do this again. I started a second company in computer crime investigation. True story is watching CSI, if you remember that show. And I'm like, that sounds cool to sneak into buildings and do this investigation. I should start that business. So I did. Um, but it worked, kind of. Um, that business hit right when the Enron trial hit. So Enron is very significant to me because we were the company that actually did the Enron investigation, not the prosecution. That's handled by the CIA, the FBI. We did the investigation for defense. So Kenneth Lay, Andrew Fastow, those people were my clients. Uh, the evidence is no longer sequestered, by the way. I get asked all the time about that case. You know, what's your assessment? Guilty. They were very guilty. Uh, yeah. And I was their defense. Um, yeah. Yeah. They got what they deserve. Um, we, uh, we went on to, um, Christy Brinkley got divorced for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time uh, from a guy named Peter Cook. We did that investigation. Uh, and sadly, we did some of the biggest murder cases in U.S. history where there's computer forensic evidence. Um, and stuff actually more heinous than murder, which I can't even talk about with the street. You know, I can't even talk about it. Um, but that business caught the eye of a Fortune 500, a company called Robert Half International. Maybe you've heard of them. They own account temps office. Have you heard of them? So they caught our eye after two and a half years of business. They bought us for millions of dollars. And uh, my business up to that point had never been profitable. Actually, I had $500,000 of debt, but I sold the business. And that time I made significant amounts of money. It became a millionaire uh, in my early 30s. And I was like, oh, that's how this works. Just crank it up, make tons of money. I mean, uh, can make tons of sales, and one day maybe someone will buy you. Um, I didn't realize how much ignorance and arrogance had started to fill me up. Um, after I told the company, the next day I went out and uh, bought a Land Rover, a uh, BMW, and a Dodge Viper, um, all within four hours. <laughs> Which you can, yeah. I, I felt necessary to show off my success and how wonderful I was. Uh, my wife and I, my family, we got a, uh, we went on sabbatical on a private island in Hawaii called Lanai. Stayed at a house that Sigourney Weaver now owns, and uh, just lived high on the hob, you know, letting money roll. Like <laughs> oh, I looked up in Webster's dictionary. I want you know someone that lives like that. What's the term? I found the word. It's a dick. <laughs> uh, Oh, and, and the Dodge Viper is the trophy of dicks. I, I don't know if you knew that. Um, I shamefully, <laughs> oh, shamefully, I'd become like this big dick, and I didn't know. Um, and I started blowing money. I also realized for this to be sustainable, I need to start many businesses. 
Uh, one venture that I also conveniently leave off my resume is I became an angel investor. I started 10 businesses simultaneously. Um, all of them failed within six months. It was a train wreck. I had no right to be in that space. I had no clue what I was doing. There was no niche specialization. They were all over the place. I was paying bills for companies that were out of business. It took, uh, by the way, I don't no longer call myself an angel investor. I'm more like the angel of death. I was that bad. And uh, I remember seeing my bank account that had hit this peak where I sold to Robert Half International dwindling so fast. And um, logically, I saw it going away, but emotionally, I couldn't accept it. I, I suspect you, too, may have been in those situations where you have a lot of money or more money than you, than you expected in an account, and it starts dwindling. And it feels like, yeah, but, but one big client will come. That one big moment will turn this. Well, this time, it didn't work for me. So um, in 2008, 11 years ago now, uh, February 14th, I got a call from Keith, my same accountant, the snorter. And uh, he said, Mike, um, I never expected to do this in my professional life uh, after working with you for so many years, but it is my recommendation that you uh, declare personal bankruptcy. And uh, I was the first kind of dagger to my heart. Um, I, I said, Keith, I, 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 what do I, I, why? He's like, well, you can't pay your taxes, you can't do anything. I said, well, can, can I just skip on taxes? Um, he, goes, uh, he goes, if you do that, you go to jail. Um, so I went on this thing called an installment plan, which by the way is worse than going to jail. Uh, it's like the legalized mob if you've ever been on an installment plan of the government. I also had to go home to my family to, to tell them what we're about to lose. I decided not to declare bankruptcy. I think that was the one smart decision I made during this period of my life. I felt that the debt I had accumulated was not the obligation of others. Even though you know, credit card companies that I don't know, I took from them. I'm the one who got in this spot. I had to dig my own way, or not dig my way up, climb it. Uh, but I had to lose my house as a result and our possessions. I had to come home on February 14th to my family to tell them what we're about to lose. And uh, how we celebrate uh, Valentine's Day at our house, similar to like a Thanksgiving dinner. We'll prepare a big meal together. But we'll also get cards, poster boards about this size. We'll fold them into cards. And I'll write to my children on the card, like, I love you. And I'll put pictures of the year together with my children. It's like literally one of my favorite holidays. My wife called me and said, Mike, make sure you're home by 5. And I said, OK, we have to sit down and talk anyway. I'll be there. She's about the meal ready and so forth. I remember pulling in next to my house at five o'clock, looking through the dining room window from about a block away. I could see my children, my wife putting the food on the table. And I couldn't walk in because I had started to cry. I mean like crying. And I didn't know what to say. By 5.15, the first text came in. Hey, where are you? By 30, this text stream started coming regularly. I can't find you. I called the office. You should have been home over a half hour ago. I think it was around 5.45, where I finally got out of the car because the text said, I'm calling the police, no one knows where you are. And I got up and I kind of stumbled to the door and my wife opened it, I was pale as a ghost except for snot and <laughs> tears pouring down. And she goes, who, who died, did someone die? And I, I, I said, well, we're, we're kind of dead, I, I've destroyed us. And I, she, I, she sat down, my children had gathered around the table, there was cold food sitting there, everyone's looking at me, and listen, I'm sharing a story not to seek your empathy or sympathy. I'm sharing a story because I suspect this has been a pathway for many of us. I don't know if your trauma has been around finance or abuse or something. I know every person in this room has had it. And um, I'm sitting there and, and we're, we're providers. We're providers for our family, for ourselves and for our families. And this is the jerk who took it all away from my family. Now I'm facing them, I'm crying. And I had to tell my wife and kids, uh, we have to be out of the house in 30 days uh, with the cell and the cars and all that, you know, it's gone. I had to look at my daughter. She was, uh, she was nine years old at the time. I had to look her straight in the eyes and say, you can't go to a horseback riding lessons. It, co it cost 20 bucks for a single session, once every couple weeks. I didn't have the money. I'm like, I'm sorry. And as I said that, she stood up and she ran, just ran, away from me. I, you know, I know you faced trauma and challenges in your life, and the solution feels like running away is the best solution. So as painful it was to see my own nine-year-old daughter so disgusted and terrified from the provider, I also respected it because I wanted to run away. But here's, here's what she was really doing. She was running to her bedroom. She ran to grab her little piggy bank. She ran back down as fast as she could. I'll never forget it. She put it on the table, looked up at me and said, Daddy, Daddy, since you can't provide for us, 
I will. <laughs> yeah. And um, if I think about that too long, I will start getting choked up, so we gotta roll. <laughs> um, but that's the darkest moment of my life. That's, the mo that's what inspires me to teach this and why I'm so fevered, or fervent, I should say, about this. I, um, that's the darkest day of my life. It's rock bottom. Have you ever heard it saying about rock bottom? It's a, it's a beautiful saying. When, when you hit rock bottom in your life, you're, you're at the very bottom. And the saying goes, at least there's only one way to go, which is up. Have you heard that, right? It's beautiful. It's total bullshit. <laughs> But it's beautiful. Here's the reality of rock bottom. You get dragged along the ocean floor. Shards of seashells tear your body apart. I, uh, the final part of my story, I went through two years of depression. Not something I'm proud of, but something I feel very compelled to share because the most afflicted community in the world with depression is us, business owners, entrepreneurs. I had what's called functional depression. You can still function, but you can't socialize or you don't. And I became a drinker. I don't really drink. I mean, someone's up for a beer later on. Like, I'm in. Uh, I'm in. Um, but like, I'm not in for like 10 beers. But that period of my life, I was just drinking to medicate. Became an insomniac. Um, but I'm grateful for that period because it challenged this, form, this old formula and it introduced me to a new formula. I remember watching TV one particular night. We were in a rental. Uh, we, uh, we couldn't afford cable television. I had... Um, uh, antenna TV, which they still uh, broadcast over high def, over antenna television. There's only three stations that came in. And uh, on the TV, there was infomercials. Starting at midnight, all they play is infomercials. And I remember sitting there, kind of, I'm like laying on the couch, it's like, I have a white t-shirt on Cheeto stains. And, and I don't even eat Cheetos. There's, you know, I don't know where they came from, some, somebody I stole from. There's you know, tequila and beer, cheap tequila, cheaper beer. And I'm sitting there, and on the TV is this actress from the 70s named Suzanne Summers with this bleach blonde hair. And she's got this stick between her legs that she's clapping called the Thigh Master. <laughs> Have you seen this thing? Like you're supposed to use this thing and you're supposed to get ripped with the Thigh Master. And I'm like, what, what, is, what am I doing? And I, and I was loving the show. I mean, this is amazing. I'm like, what? How, ah. So I decided to turn the channel. And thank God I did because this new formula presented itself. I turned the channel and a fitness instructor came on. What you're about to discover is physical fitness translates also to fiscal fitness. There was this expert talking to an audience similar to our size, it was recorded similar to this, and they broadcast on TV. And this fitness instructor starts the presentation by telling the audience, have you ever seen those gimmick products like the Thigh Master? <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, do one of these moments, I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, that is cheap tequila. <laughs> and, uh, and then she goes, there's another gimmick out there called the ab inductor. Have you heard of this, Bruce? You, there's a belt you can put on yourself and electrocute yourself <laughs> until you're ripped. <laughs> she goes, those things are gimmicks. They don't work. Those are the quick fixes. They're compelling because you say, it's like a get rich quick, but it never works. The other extreme is this thing like P90X. Have you heard of this one? You're willing to work out for four hours a day, every day of your now miserable life, <laughs> you'll be wrecked. The failure rate for P90X is very high. You know, most people don't make it. Maybe a few people in this room are doing it and, and making it, but the mass majority fail because that requires behavioral change. Gimmicks and behavioral change. She said the solution to our physical fitness is by actually not changing ourselves. If you can continue to do exactly what you do, but you change the system to make that behavior your benefit, then you'll have success. She went on to share four principles I'm gonna share with you because that's the exact same thing we're gonna do with finances. I'm gonna show you a way to not change a thing about yourself or how you operate your business, but to assure profitability. Now we do have a worksheet that was handed out right here. Um, the picture on there is me pre-beard, um, in case you want that for your refrigerator. Um, <laughs> you can pin that up there. Um, and the thing, if you also, if you want to get the notes from this presentation, you can just scan that little thing there with your, your phone, and all the notes are available for free. It'll, just, it'll send it right to you. All right, here's the answers to number one. Um, it says, society is addicted to, the word is axioms, right? That's an established belief. The world is flat, the tooth fairy is real, profit comes last, all axioms. If the prior, next blank is generation, says it's true, the current generation assumes it to be true. So it's, for the blanks, axiom, generation, generation. 
As a result, today, 83% of businesses under 25 million in revenue survive check by check. So that's the answer number one. <clears throat> the answer to number two is kind of in front of us. We've been told that profit is an event. Profit is not an event, meaning it's not an eventuality. Profit is a habit. So profit's not an event, profit's a habit. We're gonna bake it into every transaction of your business. That's how we're gonna make your business profitable. So that's the answer number two. Profit's not an event, profit's a habit. So I'm watching this fitness instructor on television and uh, <clears throat> she starts talking about the size of plates in our diet. I don't know if you noticed, 300 years ago, a plate was about this size. What we consider a coffee saucer or maybe a dessert plate was actually the standard serving plate during George Washington's time. And George Washington and his buds did the exact same behavior we do. They filled up their plates, and as their moms told them, clean off your plate. So they'd fill up their plates and eat everything that's on the plate. In the last 300 years, plates have doubled in size. But we continue to follow the same behavior. We fill up the plate, and then we consume everything that's on it. We clean off our plate. But since the plates have doubled in size, the serving portions have doubled, the caloric intake has doubled, our waistlines as a society has doubled. This fitness instructor said, the solution is radically simple. Get smaller plates. Don't change yourself, get smaller plates for your house. Anyone here have teenage boys? My chance is raising your hand if you do. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because they're not teenage boys, they are creatures. <laughs> the food consumption is ridiculous. I got two of these goons. We go through, <laughs> goons. We go through a box of Cheerios every hour at our house. You can just back up the Cheerios truck to our house because my two monsters, it's the same thing. You know, come, they can't even speak, right? They're teenage boys. Are going, oh. They come up, they put the bowl down on the kitchen table, they grab the Cheerios box, they pour it in there. There's Cheerios heaving over the bowl, it's all over the kitchen table. Very carefully, they reassemble the Cheerios like it's a Jenga tower, and then they add the milk. They pour the milk in it, there's this explosion of Cheerios. Now it's sticky Cheerios, thank you. Um, they and, and there's Cheerios everywhere. They grab their bowl, and you know, they can't speak. They're like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> when I heard this principle, I was like, oh my gosh, smaller plates. Accidentally, between me and you, I broke all the bowls at her house. Total accident. <laughs> Ten of them all at once. <laughs> I went to the local store, I bought slightly smaller bowls. Not these little like dessert cups or anything. I got slightly smaller ones. If I got super tiny ones, even those monsters would notice. I got slightly smaller ones. And they didn't notice a thing. Same thing, Cheerios everywhere, milk, blah, 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 blah. About a month later, broke all those bowls. Had to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> got slightly smaller ones. It took me about four iterations over six months. I got the bowls to half the size. And uh, our consumption went to half. They never noticed. A box of Cheerios was lasting three days at our house, which if you've teenage boys, is an absolute miracle, right? And they never noticed. We need smaller plates for our business, and this is how you do it. Um, I want to ask you a question first before I show you the exact system. I ask that you're totally candid. We're going to do this by uh, showing hands. Um, let's fold this out. This is so be totally candid with me, because this is gonna be our kind of survey equivalent. How many business owners in here have what's called a primary checking account, and I'll explain what I mean. What I mean is, for your business, you have a checking account where all your deposits go in, and you pay your bills from that. It's called a primary checking account. If you had that, raise your hand nice and high. Awesome, awesome. Almost every hand went up. That's fantastic. If you raise your hand, I want you to know you are demonstrating the natural behavior of almost all entrepreneurs I've ever surveyed. That's fantastic, because if you raise your hand, we're gonna make your business permanently profitable today. I have a second question, also be candid with me. Even though your accountant or bookkeeper may tell you, don't look at your bank account because it's not reflective of where your business stands. Instead, read your income statement, your balance sheet, cash flow statement, know your OCR, which is the operating income ratio for the cool kids. Know all those things, but don't look at your bank account because that's not reflective of your business. How many people, perhaps like me, instead do a simple system of logging into my bank account and if I have money, I know I can spend it. And if I don't, I know it's panic time. Who here checks their bank account just to see how much money you have at least once a month? Once a monthers? Once a month? Okay, right. Once a weekers? I heard no geez. Once a dayer? The OGs are like, I'm checking right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can. Awesome, awesome. If you raise your hand, I guarantee you we're gonna make your business permanently profitable because that's the natural behavior of entrepreneurs. Accounting 
There's nothing wrong with accounting. Actually, it's necessary and important, but it's not, for most entrepreneurs, a good cash management system. Accounting is making us changing our behavior. To look at all these different statements to figure things out, our behavior is to look at our bank accounts. So that's where we need the system. Here's what we're gonna do. Step one is we're gonna set up small plates for your business. And uh, this is what it looks like. I want you to uh, consider setting up five foundational accounts for your business. Over time, it actually may even be more, but here's what they are. If you're sitting in the back, I'll read them out. You can't see this. The first account, these are all checking accounts, by the way, it's called income. Second account is called profit. Third account, and this is the answer number three on your worksheet, is owner comp. These are the five accounts. Next one after that is tax. And the last one is called operating expenses, or if you want to use the cool vernacular, we call it OPEX. That's number f uh, answer number three. I want you to set whoops, these five foundational accounts. I'm just going to put a line up here because there's a significant difference for income. Let me explain what each account is. The income account is going to be a serving tray of cash for your business. Thanksgiving, I think, was uh, what, six, seven months ago. Gosh, time flies, right? I, uh, we host Thanksgiving at our house, and uh, we have about you know, 20 people over, friends and family. And uh, you know, we, we, last Thanksgiving, we pulled the turkey out of the oven, uh, and then you know, half the people come over and go, oh my god, they got to put this on Instagram, you know, Facebook, picture, 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 with every other freaking turkey in the world that's going on Facebook that day. Okay. My wife and I don't tell everyone, hey, everyone, just grab a knife and fork. Everyone for themselves. Fight for it. Eat the turkey off the serving tray. No, instead we carve the turkey. And the reason you carve the turkey is so then you can apportion a piece of turkey to every guest that wants it. You make sure everyone's fed at the table. And then, this is, this is no surprise, this is how you buy celebrate Thanksgiving or any meal that has a serving tray. You don't eat off the serving tray, you serve from it. That's what the income account is gonna be for our business, a serving tray of cash. It simply presents how much cash turkey is available to feed the entirety of our business. Because dollars have de different responsibilities. It's gotta pay us, it's gotta achieve profits, it's gotta pay our employees, it's gotta pay for the inventory we have. So the income account is simply a serving tray. We're then gonna allocate based upon percentages money to these other four of uh, the five foundational accounts. Here's what the profit account is. Oh, by the way, anyone own public stock here? Anyone trade in stock? You do? Okay, you guys do. Do you ever get uh, quarterly profit distributions from the stock? You do? Yeah, okay, me too. Me too. I own Ford. And by, this is not a stock tip recently. Um, but I own Ford stock. Listen, I own 100 shares. It's not like I'm a heavy investor or anything. And uh, a few quarters back, I got my profit distribution, $13.23. Go for it. <laughs> We're crushing it. And here's what happened. I, I opened the envelope, I pulled the check out, and I didn't say, oh man, I should reinvest this in Ford. I should plow it back. I should return the money to Ford. In fact, if all the shareholders would simply follow suit with me, we could build more buildings, hire more people. Go, Ford, go. No. I said, I invested in Ford. I've taken on significant risk. I'm hoping the stock valuation goes up, or it seems like recently, it seems to be going down more. I've taken on risk. This is a reward for being a risk taker. And I didn't say, oh, 13 bucks, I better hit the line for a little bit, work on the floor. I don't have to earn that money, I invested in the company. That's what profit is. Profit is a reward for being a shareholder and investor. And every person in this room, to be very clear, you own stock, you are an investor, it's in your own business. And you own a large amount of stock, 25, 50, 100%. Profit is a reward for doing what only 7% of the world population will ever do. 7% of the world population uh, starts a business. 93% work for the people that started the business. You are supporting our economy. You are doing amazing things for our, our cities, our country, our world, and you deserve a profit, a reward for taking on that risk, for being the sole investor in some cases. It's different than owner's comp. Owner's compensation is for what's called the owner-operator. Is anyone here have employees? Does anyone have employees? Just raise your hand if you do. All right, sir, I'm just gonna pick on you because you picked the worst seat in the house. What's your name? Mike. Mike, Mike, I'm Mike, that's cool. Mike. So your parents are awesome, right? Yeah. Um, Mike, how many employees do you have? Uh, two. Two employees, okay. This is gonna be awkward. Um, are they here? No. Oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> They're not here, they're not here, okay. So Mike, of, of, your, uh, of your team, who, just give me the first name of your best employee. Uh, Anissa. Anissa? Yeah. Okay. So Mike, we've never met before. Besides sharing an awesome name, we don't know each other. I've never visited your, your offices. You ever come to mine? But here's something I believe, yeah, I think you're lying to me. Not to hurt my feelings. I believe the best employee is not Anissa. I think it's you. I think it's you. Actually, I'm convinced it's you. 
And tell me if this is true, Mike. I suspect you work like an animal for your business. I suspect you know more about the business than this or anyone. I suspect you're the best salesperson, the best operator. I suspect you sacrifice time with your family and friends to make this business run. I suspect you don't even do vacations, you do workcations. You know, where you're like, oh, I'll be with the family, but from you know six till about eight when they're sleeping, I'll work. It just happens to be six in the morning till eight o'clock at night. They, right? Right? And I bet you've done all those things at times for very little money, or maybe no money. Is that true? Sure. Nailed it. Nailed it. I know. He's a magician too. This is amazing. A mind reader. Here and yeah, two for one. You didn't know, Bruce. But uh, speaker mind reader. Yeah. Um, but here's the deal. I'm, I'm not just picking on my. I can pick on any person in this room. We all have gone through this, or more likely, are going through this. You are the best employer your business ever had. But our ego prevents us from saying this. Could you imagine if Mike said, "I'm the best employee." We all be like, jerk, <laughs> jerk. But no, you are. So you have to own that. And the thing is, we need to pay you accordingly. Listen, if I could get Mike, this would be my dream, Mike. If I could get you to move to New Jersey, uh, Northern Jersey, and uh, forget your family and friends, I'm your now, your family. Come work for me, be my best salesperson, my best operator, sacrifice everything, oh, and I'm not gonna pay you for it. That would be the dream for me. And you would never, you would never. And of course you would never do that because your business, you know you've scored the best employee, which is yourself. The thing is, if we don't pay ourselves as the best employee, it's only a matter of time before resentment kicks in. For me, my first business, I think it was you know around year three, I was like, I hate this. Refinancing my house, paying my employees, sacrificing myself. My first business, six months in, I couldn't stand it. Couldn't wait to dump this thing. We need to pay you so you fall back in love with your business. We need to pay you to respect the fact you are the best employee. Next account is called tax. I suspect you started your business for hopefully two reasons. Hopefully you realize the impact you're having. Like you guys do significant stuff. Uh, promotional items, if we put in that category, has changed my life. Uh, we're big mug fans, by the way. Mugs were, this, the stickiness that mugs have is incredible. And the social media gains I've had have been remarkable. Actually, Mark Kudre has a profit first mug sitting on his desk. I know because I've seen it on social media. Um, you were in your underwear, which is kind of weird, but that's, a, that's a, you know, that was whatever, that's your problem. Um, so the tax account, hopefully you started your business because you're passionate about what you do and see how you're serving clients like me. Secondly, I hope you started your business for financial freedom, right? And the definition of financial freedom is not to worry about money. If you have to worry around April 15th, like where is the money to pay my taxes? Oh my gosh, we better go on sale 50% off everything today just to pay taxes. That's not financial freedom. What we're gonna do starting today is your business is going to reserve your taxes on your behalf. It can pay your taxes. And, and Mark can talk you through this. This is regards to an S Corp, C Corp, LLC, LLP, hybrid, sole corp. It doesn't matter. The business can always pay your taxes. There's just a certain way you need to do it. And the last account is called OPEX, stands for operating expenses, and that's the money to operate your business. Now, um, do you guys have is the printout? Oh yeah, it's on the back. You see the back of the printout? Yeah, good, okay. Uh, we're not gonna go into this, this is advanced topics, except for the chart in the top left. It's called the TAPS chart. Um, that TAPS stands for Target Allocation Percentages. My company conducted a survey of 1,000 businesses, industry agnostic. We actually looked at print shops, promotional items, we looked at um, law firms, pizza shops, real pizza shops, um, and <laughs> he is the dick still. Um, and, and all these different types of businesses. And what we found is in any community, there is the fiscally elite. In this market that you are in, in your industry, there are certain companies that are doing numbers like I'm about to show you or better. It's the very few, it's usually the top 5%. Mark can show you how to do it. But it, say your company does somewhere between one to five million. That puts in column D. Ignore the concept of real revenue, that's an advanced topic, so just pretend that's your actual revenue. And um, if we look at column D, you're doing say $2 million in revenue annually. Uh, the fiscally elite companies are doing 10% profit, 10% to the owner, 15% to taxes, and the remainder 65% to OPEX. Just to play the numbers out here, two million times 10% would be $200,000 at the end of every year is available to you in a $2 million business as a profit distribution, a reward for taking risk. You also have a lifestyle of $200,000 because that's your pay. This is your normalized lifestyle pay, owner's compensation. This is your bonuses coming out. Taxes would be 300,000 because when you're making, 
with this kind of money in this country, you're gonna have a big tax bill, but your business is gonna pay it for you. And that means the remainder, which is three, five, seven, 1.3 million is left to operate the business. And if I can read minds again, I suspect right now you're thinking, this guy is a fucking lunatic. Uh, is he kidding me? Like, he knows nothing about our industry. Every transaction, we lose money. We just make it up on volume. <laughs> you can't make up a volume. That's a, that's a very, that's a horrible joke. All right, that's <laughs> horrible. Um, but I think you can do this. And I think we're gonna master this once you understand, and I'd argue this is the most important thing I can share with you today, is the concept of Parkinson's Law. Um, Parkinson's Law points to the behavior of how we function with money. This is the answer, by the way, to, we are on number, oh, I skipped ahead, number five, the concept of Parkinson's Law is the answer to number five. So if you're back to that side, number five is Parkinson's Law. I did answer number four, in case you missed it. The income account acts as a serving tray only is the answer number four. You only deposit income into it and then allocate money to the other accounts. So it's serving tray and allocate for number four. Number five is the concept of Parkinson's law. Um, so let's go into that. So Parkinson was a theorist from the 1940s studying human behavior and um, studies this concept of supply and demand. Uh, there's an established accent around this. It looks like this. You probably know the supply and demand curve. What we've been told in Economics 101 is that as demand increases, supply will increase to meet demand, right? The more people want to consume the products you have to offer, the more you'll create them. Uh, the more that people want what we're doing, the more competition will set in. That's the supply demand curve. And he said, this is uh, accurate in some cases, but in many cases it's not. He goes from a behavioral aspect, it's actually reversed. He said it's actually as supply increases that demand will increase in many cases. And, and we already talked about this, the, the plate of food. As the supply of food has gotten bigger over time, bigger supply, our demand has increased for it. My addiction, my food addiction is chocolate chip cookies. I mean, I love chocolate chip cookies. Um, and if you put one chocolate chip cookie in front of me, Inevitably, I will eat it. I'll play a stupid game like, oh, I really should, I really should. And blah, right? If you put 15 chocolate chip cookies in front of me, I won't, I'll eat more than one. I'll still play a stupid game. I shouldn't, I shouldn't. Okay, okay. And I'll be sitting in the corner loathing myself. What am I doing? He pointed out as supply increases, um, demand will increase to meet that supply. He then pointed out in his study, Parkinson did, that as we constrict supply, this is now the new supply curve here, as we reduce supply, that demand is automatically reduced. It's called forced frugality, right? If you, if you only put one cookie in front of me, I can't eat two. Forced frugality. He said there's something else fascinating that happens. As we restrict supply, our behavior around that item changes. If you put one cookie in front of me, that's when I start savoring. You know, I'll lick the plate to get the extra crumbs. 15 is like, whatever, just cram in my mouth. So I become much more frugal and innovative in its use. This is true for cookies. It's true for money. It's true for toothpaste. And uh, I just want to share this because tonight you're going to experience this. Every person in this room will experience this. And I want to you say, share this because I want to prove that Parkinson's law, this behavior of supply controlling our demand, is wired into every one of us. Tonight, who, who's staying at, at a hotel, by the way? Oh, a lot of people. Okay. So me too. Tonight, when you brush your teeth, I want to watch what happens. You know, you take out your toothbrush, and you grab your tube of toothpaste, and put it on there. I, you know, with that long beat. I put it on there, and um, I turn on the hotel eyes, I turn the faucet on. I don't know what's going on in Chicago, but the water pressure here. I turn it on, the water like attacked me, hits the toothpaste, whoosh, went flying across the room. I'm like, see a toothpaste? Good seeing it. It's been a pleasure. But not really. And then I had a brand new tube, so what do I do? I put it on there. I start brushing away. When there's a full supply of toothpaste, if there's waste, who cares? We got more. Just go, baby, go. But tonight, one person in this room will have that, 
you put play your toothbrush, you look at your tube, and it's that shriveled up prune, you know what I'm talking about? A prune like gnarled toothpaste. So what happens in that moment? You become a superhero. That's what happens. The, the power, the, 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 those workouts you've been for your entire life is now gonna pay off. Right? You see that empty tube of toothpaste, you're like, okay, game on, another. Game on. I've been waiting for this moment. Right? And you're in your hotel room saying this to yourself, by the way. And then you grab the tube of toothpaste, and that's when you start the twisting and the turning. You're like, come, 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 come. You know? You had that vein you didn't realize you have when your forehead starts pulsing in the mirror. Neighbors in the hotel are like, what the hell's going on over there? It's a murder. You're like, you son of a bitch, I'll kill you! <laughs> 911 gets called. Yeah, you, know, you start twisting it. The innovation's unbelievable. Some, some people tell me they put it in the door jam and start slamming the door. What one guy told, oh, cut off the backside of toothpaste. Go the other way, baby. In through the outdoor. <laughs> Which when he said in through the outdoor, I'm like, that's just. You're screaming in a hotel room by yourself saying in through the outdoor. Then, what? <laughs> Have you read the turtle head of toothpaste? You know what I'm talking about? You know, the double thumb grip. Like you, you put both thumbs behind the toothpaste tube, you're like, come on, you start pushing, and all of a sudden, with enough garnished strength, the little turtle head starts poking up. It's like, hey, what's, what's going on? You, are you getting to brush your teeth today? Right? And you're like, yeah. But the only way to get that little turtle is you have to grab your toothbrush. So, you, so just for a second, just for a second. One thumb like launches over, one hand launches over, and as you release the thumb, it's a turtle after all, it's like, oh, I know what you're doing, bitch. <laughs> right? And you're like, oh my god. Somehow, miraculously, you scoop out one droplet of toothpaste on one bristle hair, and you're like, that's all I wanted, that's all I needed, right? <laughs> that's the turtle I And listen, the story here is supply of the toothpaste gets restricted, we become more innovative in using it. Frugality, we keep on using it. I bet you a new tube of toothpaste lasts you, I don't know, four weeks? Well, how an empty one? I bet you can stretch that one for three, sometimes four weeks, right? Parkinson's law. Now here's the beauty. You are living it, because you laughed at it, it means you're doing it. You are living Parkinson's law, every human being is. And that means it's wired into us for toothpaste, for cookies, it's wired into us for money. You see, this is the toothpaste tube down here. As we start constraining and restricting the amount of cash available to operate our business, it will force frugality. It will force you to find ways to make the business operate. Mark pointed out that one company cut their staff in half and they're making more profit than ever before. Force frugality, right? They, they did it by getting rid of clients. And they're, and they're doing profit first. So see, they're, they seem like they're wonderful. They seem like the nicest people I've ever met. So they're, they're doing the system. So you, as you constrain the amount of money available to run your business, you will find a way. And if you've started your business, or if you've grown your business, I know you've already done stuff like this. I'm sure there was a moment where you didn't have the right equipment or the right time, and you still found out a way to deliver. This will bring us back to that innovative thinking. Parkinson's law. Okay. Um, so let's go on to the next. So that was step one. So remember, I'm, I'm watching this television. While I had all this beer and all this stuff, I started having such clarity. I'm taking notes like crazy. This is something I had to do for myself, and I did. Started ten year, over 10 years ago now. Okay, but there's a second step this fitness instructor was sharing. She talked about the, uh, the danger of temptation. When, when something's tempting and put in front of us, there is, oh, I'm, you know what, actually, I'm skipping something. Let me share one more step. She talked first about sequences. You, you know, the order of how things are presented, she shared, was very important. And um, when it comes to food, I don't know if you know this, most diets, all food is served simultaneously. So, you know, the next time you go out for dinner, the, if you like steak like I do, the meat, the potatoes, and the vegetable medley, you know, mush, is there. And what do I do? When everything's served simultaneously, I default to my preference. I defer to that and say, oh, I'd rather have some steak first. Ooh, some potatoes, not bad, more steak. The vegetables can wait. You know, the most discarded food item in the world is vegetables. We can go outside any restaurant anywhere, anywhere in the world, and the most discarded food item is vegetables. The irony is we all know the importance of vegetables, the vitamins, the nutrients, the, the, the fiber, but it's not our preference for most of us, so we default to this meat and potatoes or whatever your preference is. She shared, again, never change yourself. She said change the system. She said next time you're about to eat, serve just vegetables, nothing else. 
And now you're, it's, you're forced to eat them. I don't know, edamame or whatever. Oh, not too bad. You have some of that. Then, after a period of time, you next serve the meat and potatoes. And because it comes in sequence, when we eat the meat and potatoes, we eat less of it because we already got the vegetables in us. It brings automatic balance. The sequence of how you do things is very important. Well, in this system, the sequence is this order. When you put money onto the income, into the income account, remember, it's a cash turkey. You never eat off the serving tray. We allocate money. Always allocate money to the profit account first. Because, and this is the letter R, it says reward, because it's a reward mechanism. If you have a bookkeeper or accountant managing your books right now or managing your accounts, I encourage you just for the, if you set the system up for a period of time, do this yourself. Because when you allocate, you know, 10%, say $1,000 comes in, you allocate 10%, 100 bucks to profit, you'll feel reward. Huh, I just made a profit, 100 bucks, cash, sitting there for me. It's a dopamine release. Next one is you're gonna pay the most important employee in the company, which is you, the business owner. Another reward mechanism, dopamine release. So it's a behavioral response, reward, reward. Paying taxes, shockingly, is not a reward, um, in case you didn't know, but it does protect you from getting, going to jail, so it's a protection mechanism. So it's reward, 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 protect, and the OPEX account is serve. It serves your business. So the sequence of how we do things is extremely important. Um, that's the answer to number six. The sequence, the word is sequence, of how things are presented dictate our use of those things. If we take our profit first, we'll assure our profitability. And it'll embolden us to do more of it because we're doing it first. Reward mechanism. Now onto the third step. So I'm watching this fitness instructor. She starts talking about temptation. You know, she's talking about temptation with food. And uh, she explains that the only way to prevent the consumption of something is not through willpower. It's through removing its accessibility in the first place. Willpower is like a muscle. It fatigues. You can put a chocolate chip cookie in front of me, and I'll look at it, and I'm actually trying to prepare for an athletic event with my son. He wants to do the Spartan race um, yeah, with a 47-year-old, and he's 17. Um, he, he's still eating Cheerios and is still going to kick my ass. Um, but I've hired a coach, and the coach said, first thing is get off bad carbs, start doing this, lift weights, blah, blah, blah. There is no cookies in my house because I can't stop myself. I play the same game every time. I go, oh, I really shouldn't, but it doesn't hurt to smell the soft baked chew chocolate chip triple chunk cookies. I sniff it, and, and then the game's over, and I eat it. So there's none there. And actually, I couldn't find any here. I really looked around. <laughs> yeah. Um, remove the temptation. Here's what we need to do in your business. Whatever bank you work with today, if you like them, keep working with them. We'll call this bank one. We need to find a second bank, we'll call it bank two. And the goal of bank two is it's a remove temptation bank. I encourage you to set two accounts there. One's gonna be called profit hold. One's gonna be called tax hold. The idea is the money that accumulates, when you allocate profit, we're gonna invoke a transfer over to the second bank, same thing with taxes, to get out of sight and out of mind. Here's the, if you didn't do this, here's the problem I ran into right away. I ran, I was running my business, I looked at my OPEX account, I looked at my bills, I didn't have enough money to pay my bills. I looked at my profit account, I said, oh, there's cash there, maybe I'll just borrow from my profit account. The, the second you do that, uh, rename profit to Peter, and we'll rename OPEX to Paul, because you're stealing from Peter to give to Paul. It, it, unwind, it unwinds the whole system if we steal from ourselves. And that's what I did. I borrowed from profit and never paid it back. But once it was out of sight and out of mind, I couldn't see my profit, then I had to figure out how to make it work off of this. And, and, and if you don't have enough money to pay your bills at this stage, that's your business telling you you can't afford your bills. If you can't pay your bills, you can't afford your bills. That's your business speaking to you, saying, if you want to achieve 10% profit, if you want to pay yourself fairly and appropriately, if you don't want to worry about taxes, this is what you must do. I was in New York City teaching this a few years back to an audience and uh, someone to this, and uh, this one guy comes up to me at the end of the presentation, he goes, hey, I really enjoyed the Profit First presentation, I'm gonna do it. And uh, I said, okay, oh, that's great, tell me about your business. He said, I have an $8 million business, which I hope, starting today, when you hear revenue, you put no weight into that. I don't care how much revenue anyone has. What I care about is how healthy a business is. So I said, oh, that's great, $8 million, but tell me, how healthy is your business? He goes, ah, we lost half a million dollars last year. Say, so, okay, what was the year prior? Ah, we lost a million dollars that year. 
He goes, we have so much debt. He goes, I'm about to go out of business. He goes, the reason I'm telling you how to do this system is not because I believe in it, because I'm so skeptical of this. He goes, but I'm desperate. I'll try it out. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of you were skeptical. I, I was skeptical. I had to do this out of desperation. I hope you're willing to give it a try, but I appreciate and respect skepticism. And uh, his name was Peter. We've become very good friends now. I actually talk to him every Friday. And uh, he called me about three months after setting the system up. He set these accounts up at a second bank. And I just want to share his story because I think you can leverage what he did. He's in New York City, like I told you. He found a bank in New Jersey. Step one is find a bank that is far from you. It was about a three-hour drive for him to get there. Um, I call it the drive of shame, by the way, because if you're driving there and you want to take profit out for any other reason besides rewarding the shareholder and celebrating with, if you're trying to borrow or steal from yourself, that should be a drive of shame. So I want you to think about it. He went into the bank, the second bank, and uh, he walked up to the teller and said, hey, I want to set some new accounts here because I'd like to store money at your bank. <laughs> I don't know if you know this. There's a, a button, you know, those tellers have there. If, if someone's going to rob the police, right? There's another button when someone says, I'd like to store money at the bank. Apparently, because that tower hit the button. Because the manager comes running out, fixing his tie. He's, you know, he's like, oh, welcome to the most convenient bank in America. We love when people want to store money with us. <laughs> and uh, Peter, uh, he goes on to tell Peter, he's like, you know, we have ATM card, starter check, online bank. We have a limousine packed with cash. We'll drive it wherever we want to go. And uh, Peter looks at him square in the eyes and says, I don't want the most convenient bank in America. I want the most inconvenient bank in America. No starter checks, no online banking, no ATM card. Because the only way I can withdraw money is if I drive three hours to get here and I ask you, the bank manager, to write me a certified banker's check to share my profit. And he goes, I might do that. Please slap me in the face a few times to make sure I really deserve this money. <laughs> Set something up like that. Remove the availability of the cash so you have to live off of a near empty tube of toothpaste and you will blow your mind away of how profitable your business will become. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we, I started the system 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. I've had 43 consecutive quarters of profit distributions in my businesses. And um, we decided very early on to start sharing the profit with my children because they're investors in my business, not financially, of course. They're investors through sacrifice. I am on the road a lot. I'm not home a lot. So my kids have and are making a big sacrifice. Dad and I are rent. I'm making a sacrifice too. And we said, well, one way to address this is just to reward them, to show appreciation. So we share a piece of the profit with each kid. I remember giving my son, my youngest son, he was six years old at the time in kindergarten, the first profit distribution on the first quarter. Second quarter, my kindergartner comes to me and he goes, hey daddy, how's Q2 looking? <laughs> Too. We're good, son. We're good. Um, that's accountability. Like, if I don't bring home profit, I'm getting kicked, my ass is getting kicked by a kindergarten. Um, so, do something like that. Remove accessibility. And just one little side story. This has no relevance, a little bit of relevance, but I just think it's funny. I'm enjoying you guys uh, so much. I thought you'd get kicked out of this. I, I'm in, I was in Idaho, I think it was speaking to a very small group, 20 people, same topic, I'm so passionate about this, I go everywhere. I'm speaking, and I share this concept of removing temptation, and I told uh, them about my addiction to chocolate chip cookies. While I'm there, this woman uh, picks up the phone, and she takes a call, and I, listen, it's kind of weird during presentation to do a call right there, but we're entrepreneurs, if opportunity strikes, I get it, go for it. She hangs up the phone, 10 minutes later, the door comes in open, and there's a guy with like three or four pizza boxes, kind of Frankenstein's way in, steamrolling out. He goes, did someone order this? And that woman, she raised her hand, she goes, oh yeah, that was me. He starts walking toward her, and she goes, oh no, that's not for me, that's for the speaker guy. I'm the speaker guy. <laughs> his friend's name, but the speaker guy was good. Um, the, he, he puts this box on the little stage up there, these three or four pizza boxes, steamrolling out, and then he opens one of them, and it wasn't pizza, it was hot, baked, soft chew, chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Seriously. And I, I, I mean, are you kidding me? I just told you this is my addiction? And you, what, you put it in front of me? What if I told, told you I was addicted to cocaine? <laughs> <laughs> Which I told that joke in Miami, it did not go well. <laughs> I, was, I was asked to leave, yeah. Um, <laughs> Remove the, the Remove the temptation, remove the temptation. 
I'm watching this fitness instructor. She shares one fourth and final principle, and it's about this concept of peaks and valleys. She said we need to enter a process of eating more meals more frequently, just lower amounts of food. Most of us eat three meals a day, but we go into what's called a peak hunger state. You haven't eaten, you're so hungry, and then when we do eat, we overeat, and it's like, I shouldn't have eaten that much. It stretches our stomach, we actually enter that overeating process again, and it's these peaks and valleys. She said if we eat five small meals a day, it starts to normalize our caloric intake because you never have this extreme hunger. It actually reduces it. Well, you know, in business, I know you know this, we experience peaks and valleys all the time. Revenue's up, business feels great, the next day all that money's gone, business feels like crap, up and down. We're, we're manic like that, you know, bipolar is what we are, these are as entrepreneurs, because you know, one day is the best day of our lives because a big deposit came in, the next day we want to kill ourselves. It's like, oh my God. Our income uh, can, though, can be normalized following a process we call the 1025 rule. And uh, today's the 13th, so this is the days of the month, the next trigger would be the 25th. And then the 10th, so let's draw a little chart here, 25th, 10th, 25th, 10th. And this pattern just repeats on forever. This is the income account, the serving tray of cash. And what happens is money will come in today, the 13th. Hopefully you get a deposit today in your business. But the income account is the serving tray. The money comes in there. It just sits there. We never touch it. It just sits there. Well, no, I shouldn't say we don't. We just don't touch it today. We wait for the trigger today, the 25th. Tomorrow, maybe some more money comes in. The day after, some more money comes in. Maybe nothing. On the 25th, all the money, all the money in the income account gets allocated out based upon the percentages. Income account goes to zero. Money goes to profit. We hide it away at the second bank so we can't see it. Money goes to owner's compensation so we ensure that the best employee is rewarded. Money goes to the tax account, hidden away so we can pay our taxes but we don't borrow from it. And the toothpaste tube gets filled up and that's what you have to operate your business on. Starting on the 25th, money accumulates in, accumulates in. On the 10th, all the money in the income account goes to zero and we, as we allocate out again. And this process repeats over and over and over. And it forms you know, a pattern that could look something like this, something like that. What's gonna happen is by logging into your bank account, and I did the survey, almost all of you raised your hand, some of you said do it hour, hourly, daily, that is the best behavior you can do. Because every time you log in, all I challenge you to do is look at your income account and see how much money's in there on average. On the 10th and 25th, how much money do you expect? I'll just pick a random number, say it's $10,000. So every 10th and 25th, you look in there and say, normally I expect $10,000, but sometimes there'll be less money in there. Other times, there'll be more money. When there's fluctuations outside of what you expect, that is a call to action. Just call your bookkeeper or accountant, talk to a guy like Mark and say, hey, what's happening? Is it the seasonality that's affecting us? Do, are we not doing collections right? You know, what's going on here? Let's do more of this, Mark. This is a call to action. This is the most simplified version of a cash flow management statement. I don't know if you know how to read an accounting cash flow management statement. I sure as heck don't. I question if my accountant knows how to between me and you. They're complex. But this shows the delta, meaning the change, in our cash flow. And when it's outside a realm of normal expectation, it's a call to action. Just Talk to someone else, investigate it. Try to replicate the good ones, try to fix the bad ones. That's the thing. And um, by the way, the reason we do this on the 10th and 25th of the month is as you allocate money out, the 10th and 25th, your OPEX account will be funded every 10th and 25th. That's when you pay your bills. When you pay bills on the 10th, they usually arrive by the 15th. That's probably when half your bills are due to your vendors. When you repeat this process on the 25th, the bills will arrive by end of month, probably when your other half of bills are due. So it gets you into a normalized payment schedule with your vendors. They, to be, they deserve to be paid on time, just like we do. But more importantly, it lets you show, see the transactions that are going on and how much cash is accumulating or not and take action accordingly. There's another part of this rhythm, this is my favorite, it's the 90-day rhythm. What I want you to do is every 90 days, the money that's accumulated in your profit account, it's gonna come out. I don't recommend 100% of that money. I think we should have a cash reserve for an extreme, unique circumstance and for what's called cash equity. But I would say 50% of the accumulated money that's in there comes out to you as a reward to the shareholder quarterly. And, and why quarterly? You know, I've been studying large companies like Ford and different companies. Not, I don't have an affinity or a love for large corporations. I have a respect for them. I mean, they started in a room just like this too. They've grown to that size. I just love small business. I love small business. But those big businesses started like us, and the only way to achieve, like, you know, Google has 100,000 employees. 
The only way to achieve that size is through absolute fiscal discipline. You, you have a massive payroll every week. You have to know your numbers. You have to be fiscally disciplined. And the golden rule with every public company is first and foremost, reward the shareholder, right? The investors, the risk takers. So every corporation knows at the end of every 90 days, reward the people that are supporting us through profit distribution. And that's the fiscal discipline lesson from the large corporations we need to embrace. Every 90 days, give a bonus check to the smart men and women who started these businesses, risked their lives to do this, their families and so forth, and their financials to do this. Reward them. And your job with the profit distribution is to celebrate. That's actually the answer to number, oh, the answer number eight is peaks and valleys. Uh, that was the prior thing. But uh, number nine is profit is used to celebrate. Um, if you reinvest or plow back, those are, those are two terms I hear all the time. I, um, and I'll explain in a second, but if you reinvest or plow back the money into your business, you are training yourself to completely disregard profit. And are avoiding the call for efficiency, that's the next blank, frugality, and uh, innovation. But, and by the way, uh, I know I speak quickly and we were going through this pretty fast. If you've missed any of the answers, they're already all on the worksheet at the very bottom. If you didn't notice that, um, that's, that's not a disclaimer. That's not, oh, I thought that was the nonsense center. Yeah, so this guy is, he is a magician and a mind reader. That's a three for one deal. I hear the terms reinvest and plow back all the time and uh, they drive me nuts. I, I met this person just, just yesterday, I was at an event, they came back and said, you know, we proudly had a 22% profit last quarter. I said, it's amazing, what'd you do with it? We plowed it all back into the business. Oh, everything. So I said, how much came out? Nothing. I said, great. So I said, you took a 22% profit, you put it back in the business, what happened when we went in the business? We spent it. Oh, so it was an expense? Exactly. I'm like, okay, so you took money and you spent it as an expense and you no longer have it. That's correct. That's it. And it was a great profit. I'm like, okay, you know what? That's actually no profit whatsoever. We have it. I'm not just picking that person, but what we have is when we call something profit and then we spend it, it was never a profit. That's a shell game. It's an expense. When the second that money goes out the door, it's an expense. It never was a profit. The only definition of profit is when it gets distributed to the owner. So if you use the terms reinvest or plow back, those are all very soft terms for saying more expenses, more expenses, more expenses. Profit comes out to celebrate. And you define the celebration. It's, you're the shareholder. Maybe it's paying off personal debt. Maybe it's saving for your future. Maybe it's an amazing vacation. Or maybe it's your first profit and it's an amazing time at Starbucks for the eight bucks or whatever you take out. Because that was my first profit distribution. And that was my favorite profit distribution. My 43 quarters back, my first profit distribution was eight dollars and change. And I'll tell you, it was my favorite because I went right to Starbucks with cold, hard cash. And, and I had to break into singles, you know. Let's break this. I had eight singles. I laid it on the table and said, my company is buying the most expensive drink I can afford for that. A grande vente map blabadoo, or whatever. And that's what they gave me. And it was the best coffee of my life. And I think you'll, I know you'll experience the same thing. When the profit starts coming out, you will start getting emboldened and empowered and you'll start getting what you deserve, even if it starts off at $8 and builds up over time. Every 90 days, the money comes out. What I shared with you is the entire Profit First system. And uh, I used to end the presentation right here, but there's one more thing I want to share with you. Because about four years ago, I was doing this presentation in Copenhagen, Denmark, and um, a thousand people in the audience. The year prior, I had been invited to talk about Profit First. I just released my book then, and talked about it. They invited me back four years ago to do an advanced version. We're doing the basics, to do an advanced version of it. Same thousand people, it was the same conference. I started the conference and said, hey, who saw me speak last year? You know, all thousand hands went up. I'm like, that's great. I said, you, know, you, you all said you were struggling with profitability, you were surviving check by check, you, you, ran, your bank about, you ran your business off your bank balance, uh, you said you love profit first because you don't need to change. I said, who's doing it? And as I said that, all of a sudden, everyone had to start taking notes. Like, no, like, do not make eye contact with the speaker. <laughs> Just pretend you're writing something. Oh my God. And my face turned beet red. A thousand people, who all said they needed something like this, no one did it. And I got pissed. I was like, what's wrong with you, Copenhagen? Which, just a quick aside, if anyone here is a professional speaker or aspires to be a professional speaker, tip number one, don't yell at the audience. 
not good. As I'm getting all jacked up, I, I, the epiphany hit me. I said, oh my gosh, I left out the most critical step. I taught the entire system, but I, if you try to do this entire thing, it is such an abrupt shift to how you've been running your business. This may devastate your business. Actually, this may be the worst thing you do. It's too much of a change. You, you've got to your business where you are today. That's pretty darn good. To all of a sudden introduce this whole thing is like telling someone that's never, never run a marathon on day one to go run a marathon. Don't do it. Instead, we need to step in slowly. And uh, I discovered a book about this that I'll, I'll share the story from it, but the book's called Decisive, um, written by two authors, Chip Heath, Dan Heath, their brothers, and they were studying entrepreneur's mindset. The book's called Decisive. And um, they were studying the mindset of entrepreneurs. And what was so interesting was in this one study, they challenged the concept of raising the bar. Entrepreneurs, business owners were always told, raise the bar, push yourself. How badly do you want it? Uh, there's terms like BHAG, what's your big, hairy, audacious goal? What's your 10X factor? They said, what if, what if we have more success by lowering the bar? And they ran a study. And I'll share the study with you. They, they ran a study in physical fitness, which interestingly translates again to physical fitness. They took 100 participants, in, uh, 200 participants, and brought them to a room. They put 100 into the raise the bar group, and they put 100 into the lower the bar group. What they were looking at was a cardiovascular fitness. The standard regimen for cardiovascular fitness is if you can run three miles, three days a week consistently, you'll achieve good, strong cardiovascular fitness. This group, when they came in, they were told to do that. So 100 people come in, the researchers are like, do you want to get physically fit? And the group's like, yes, we want it. They said, then get out there and run three miles, three days a week starting now. And the group goes running out. Never had exercised before. This group, the lower the bar group, comes in. The researchers say, do you want to get physically fit? And the group's like, yeah, we want it so badly. They said, great, we have a question for you. Do you like to watch television? And the group's like, uh, yeah. Like one, one guy's like, I like Modern Family. Like it's, a good, it's a good show, good show. The researchers then said, do you sit on your couch when you watch television? And the group's like, I do. I do sit on the couch. They said, for your exercise regimen, would you be willing to stand in front of the couch when you watch TV as opposed to sit? That was it, that was it. I mean, talk about lowering the bar. That's below the Earth's crust. Like, that is so low. For the next two weeks, the control group was running three miles, three days a week. This group was standing when watching television. They came back after two weeks. This group already had, it was an 89% failure rate, if I recall correctly. 11 people were still running three miles, three days a week. Of the 89 people, one person had a heart attack. Did, did you just laugh at him? Because he's dead now. He's dead now. I just want you to, no, he's not. I, I have no idea. I just try to pick on you. That's, all right. Uh, he's, hopefully he's alive. Um, and has self-pity because you laughed at him. <laughs> of the lower the bar group, 100% success. Everyone just starts standing in front of the television. Easy. Lower the bar. The next two weeks, the researchers went to the last 11 people and said, you're the last, you're the last 11 standing. Represent the group. Push yourself. Run. And they go, you know, they're hobbling out. One guy's like grabbing his leg. This group, they said, well, now you're standing in front of the television. Would you be willing to simply march in place now? You're standing anyway. They're talking about lowering the bar. They kept it low. For the next two weeks, they do this. They come back. After one month, the control group that was told to raise the bar had a 100% failure. No one could sustain it. And if you aren't cardiovascularly fit currently, please don't start running three miles three days a week starting today for the next month. This group had a 98% success rate after a month, you know, just marching in front of the couch. Which does beg the question, two people are like, did he say stand and march in front of the couch or sit back on my lazy fat ass? I don't, I, I don't recall. Okay, this group they continued with, this group was done. They went to the, uh, the test group and they said, now that you're marching in front of the couch, would you be willing to do calisthenics while watching television for the next two weeks? Sure, they did that. Then it became running outside during commercial breaks and running back in. It did take them six months. After six months, 52% of this group was running three miles, three days a week. The majority succeeded by lowering the bar. This is the final and most important thought I can leave you with when it comes to profitability. We're gonna set the bar so low that my promise to you is by the next work day, Monday or Tuesday, when you're back in the office, I can assure you permanent profitability and it's really easy. Instead of saying all these accounts and so forth, this is ultimately what we want to get to. Two steps. Step one is on Monday, go to your bank or call them up and set up one account called profit. It's a savings account, 
Maybe it takes you a half hour, it's a quick visit to the bank. Step two, allocate only 1% of your income to the profit account. So I'm saying if a $1,000 deposit comes in, take 10 bucks. Because I know if you can run your shop off of $1,000, you can run it off of $990. There's no question about that. But the impact will happen because this little account here will start accumulating money. And that's where I found confidence kicks in. Mark and I have over 150,000 businesses doing the Profit First system now. And the successful ones, all those 150,000, did it by starting really slow. That 1% for a few months, and they said, well, what if I get profit 2%? What if I decide to take 3%? What if I introduce an account to take care of myself and taxes? Maybe it takes a year or two to roll out the entire system, but they get there and they run three miles, three days a week. They become very profitable. I want you to remember this. We've been told this is the foundational formula for profitability. It is a mere axiom. I believe it's in fact a lie. I understand the logic, but it fails the vast majority of us. Profit is not the bottom line, it's not the last consideration. Profit needs to come first. Profit comes first. The answer number 10 is this. What comes last gets ignored, and that's why most businesses aren't profitable. What comes first, answer number 10, gets done. And now you know the system to become permanently profitable. Take your profit first. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. 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 Awesome, guys. Thank you guys so much. Did you guys have questions that you want to ask, Mike? Yeah. Oh. All right. Let's bring him back for a couple minutes before uh, he's got to head off to the flight. You got it. Okay. Cool. Michael Collins. Cool. I'm back again. Hey, I haven't seen you guys in a while. Whoops. Is this off? This is now off. Now it's on. Okay. I haven't seen you guys in a while. How are you? Um, yes. Question. We'll start there and we'll go around. So if you're looking to grow your business in terms of like purchasing a new piece of equipment or something like that, where are you taking the money from? How does that look in your program? Awesome question. So we have a simple rule with account of profit first. We call it if in doubt, add an account. Almost rhymed. Uh, we would call it a cap, <laughs> kind of quasi rhyme. We could either call it CapEx, capital expenditure, or equipment. So you, maybe equipment might be better. So we set up an equipment account. Once you do this, then we got to change the allocation to say, well, maybe OpEx can't be 65%. Maybe we got to reduce this. And maybe momentarily we've got to squeeze back down our profit and take this down from 10 to 8% and start allocating money here. So I used to own a manufacturing business. We made leather products. Not like what you do, but kind of similar. We had to buy raw materials. In our case was leather, and we had to buy what's called clicking presses, a big 50 ton press, it click out the leather. Those things are expensive. A, a new one costs like 70,000, a used one, a used good one, $30,000. Um, what we started doing was we started paying for the clicking press uh, immediately, and when we said we're gonna need to buy one soon, uh, maybe the next year or two, but we started making the installments and payments here immediately, and started paying for it. Then when it came to buy the clicking press, we already had the money saved up. In the meantime, we went down to a different shop that did the clicking for us, and we were able to pay for it that way. So, great question. Yes, uh, sir, yeah, the first blue shirt guy, then the second blue shirt guy. Payroll, how do you do payroll? Yeah, so you have an S Corp or C Corp, I presume? Do you have an S Corp or a C Corp? Uh, S Corp. S Corp, okay. So here's the, yeah, the S Corpers always bring that one up, payroll. All right, so you would have another account, and down add account, you probably already have a payroll account, and ADP or whoever processes your payroll probably pulls from this. You would still allocate money to owner's comp. This is important, this is a behavioral mechanism. Allocate money to payroll like you normally do out of OPEX or however you pay payroll. Uh, you also allocate money to owner's comp. Right before you do the payroll processing, you then invoke a transfer over and move the money. But we need to, because you told me, never, you log into your bank accounts, we need, I need you to have the assurity that your payroll, your pay, the most important employee, is addressed first. Then we can invoke a transfer over. You're talking about paying on the 10th and the 25th, but if you do weekly payroll. Yes, so if you, you can do a different rhythm. You can, if you do weekly payroll, changes from the 10th and 25th to every Friday. You can do this process, yeah, great question. The gentleman behind that gentleman. Um, if you have some type of a profit sharing, Situation. So with employees? With employees. You take that out of the profit or you take that out of the operating expense? So, yeah, so our company does, I have 14 employees, we take our profit out of the profit account. So <laughs> my team is acutely aware of profit. They actually know, we have open book management. They don't know my compensation because they don't know the tax allocation, but they do know these other two accounts. So it, they, they can try to guess. Um, 
but the profitability, <laughs> and, they, and they do, they do. Um, but the profitability, they share in that. But here's, here's why profit sharing, if no one does profit sharing, or if you don't do profit sharing, I wanna make you consider it. I'm staying at a Hampton Inn about 30 miles out as opposed to staying in the city. The reason is, uh, when I do speaking engagements, we usually get what's called a buyout. The, the host just says, here's a flat fee to pay for your travel and your lodging, because I'm being buying all around to have the host schedule, it's a pain in the butt. My uh, assistant who schedules this shares in the profit. So I usually end up saying the cheapest hotels in, the, in, in some sometimes shaky neighborhoods. Uh, and she's like, but we saved $80 last night. Um, and, and she knows that translates to you know, $13 or whatever to her. So um, it works really well. Because they're not just cutting or controlling costs on my own activity. They're controlling costs throughout the business. So I'm happy you're doing that. The, the woman behind you, yes. So does this eventually get rid of finance because you can operate without debt? Oh, oh, with financing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark, you can probably talk to this. I, I'll just give a short answer. The answer is, in many cases, you become a self financier um, There is times that you may want to still leverage debt. The thing is, most businesses don't know what leverage is. Leverage is where you take a dollar and you're guaranteed to get $2 back 60 days from now. There's a time frame and a guaranteed return, or a high probability. Most people call leveraging, I'm gonna borrow money with hope and it kind of falls apart. So um, yes, over time you will eradicate your debt uh, and you'll be self-financed and then take it from there. Yeah, great question. Gentlemen, way in the back of the hat. Mike, uh, can you just touch real quick on materials now? Uh, materials as opposed to equipment? Yeah. So like t-shirts or whatever, yeah. Yeah, so well you just, you gave your own answer right there. Uh, you would open another account called materials, right? So. Yeah, if in doubt, open an account. So I would do a materials account, and that's probably a major part of your cost. So I think for most of the businesses in here, that's a really smart idea. I would set that account up and be allocating money to there regularly. The thing is, this will then tell you how much money you have for materials. This will tell you, like, you know, the t-shirts you're buying too expensive, or maybe the, 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 the deal you're getting because you're buying more quantity isn't a deal because the funds aren't there. That's when your business starts talking to you. Could you just put that on op you, you can put an OPEX, and you can climb it all together. Over time, most businesses start with the foundational five, and they start adding ones for specific clarity. Most businesses have, over time, but this gets unwieldy in the beginning, can have 10, our company has 15 accounts. But that's over time. I would suggest start with as few as possible, to your point, run it out of OpEx, and if you need clarity for materials or something like that, then add that account. All right, let's, let's go to this side of the room, and we'll bang back to the back. I got two things. First off, I don't know if this is, your plan works, but you're funny as shit. Oh, thanks, brother. Oh, I love you. Go. Secondly, have you ever tried to apply this to your own personal finances? Awesome question. So first of all, your first comment was unbelievably good. <laughs> uh, and in regard, brother, in regards to your second question, um, yes, you can apply it to your personal finances. Um, if you have the book Profit First, or if you feel compelled, you want to get it, there's a chapter I dedicate to, I call it the Profit First Life. Oh, you have a copy right there? Oh, you can hold it nice and high. So that's in spin around. That's my model. Um, and um, yeah, so you can, in there, there's a section called Profit First Life. And yes, you can do this in your personal accounts. At my house, we have a vacation fund. We just got back from vacation. We use the money from the vacation fund. We're, we're going to buy a new car, but we're not going to buy it yet because our car account doesn't have enough money to buy the car for cash yet, but it's getting closer. We're probably still a year and a half out. And so we have these different accounts. We have about, <laughs> about 20. Uh, I have a debit, I run only on debit cards, everything's debit. I have a credit card just for an extreme emergency, but that's how we do it. Was there a question over here? Is that, yes? Um, I was sort of interested in like, how do you deal with existing debt? Okay, I love this question. What if you have existing debt? And so, you know, you ask a question that's probably true for 90% of this room. Um, how do you handle debt? I'm gonna share a strategy called the debt snowball. This is not my strategy. There's a guy named Dave Ramsey. If you want to handle your personal finances, if, if you probably heard of him, he's excellent. We were just talking about that, because I think that what you're talking about for the business, he's like... It's Dave Ramsey-esque, yeah. He's for personal, and you're for like business. That's right, that's right. So I, there's an event called Entree Leadership, I keynoted at, that's Dave Ramsey's event. I spoke there last year. You, someone, were you there? Awesome, rock and roll. So I was at Entree Leadership speaking, and uh, this correlates to Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey came up with this concept called the debt snowball. It is fabulous, because it speaks to the behavior around money. What he explained is that our natural tendency with debt 
is to address debt that has the highest interest rate first. That's a logical, appropriate approach. So some debt, you know, if you have a, a credit card that's nailing you, you may have 20% here, 30% Mark has one debt. Mark, you're in trouble. Oh, oh, I thought, I thought, they're starting at 25 now. You're getting hammered, bro. All right, um, you know, 7%, 4%, maybe a friend of yours that, you know, no, no interest. And then there, there's a dollar amount associated with me. Your credit card has $15,000. Maybe this one has, you know, uh, whatever. It's a, it's a major loan of $200,000 for equipment or something. Maybe this is $3,000. I'm just picking random numbers. $7,000. Maybe your friend lent you know, like 500 bucks or something. And our behavior is, you know, first of all, ignore our friend. Thanks for the money. I, you know, just ignore them. Um, and then we start, we're told to focus here. Dave Ramsey, and, and you have to pay a minimum installment on everything else except for your friend. You have to pay a minimum installment to maintain these. Dave Ramsey said the better approach is not to pay based upon interest rate from a behavioral aspect. It's to pay about the amount due. So he says actually put the $500 debt first, then the $3,000 debt in this case, then the $7,000, then the $15,000, then the $200,000. Because we have these minimum installments that we made. Say for $15,000, we got to pay, I'm just going to pick a random number. Uh, thousand dollars a month to maintain that this one's like say five thousand dollars a month say this one is like 500 this is like 600 a month and this one you're not paying a friend anything because <laughs> they're a friend after all you're just gonna bang them over the head <laughs> then what happens is when if you have debt the only way to get out of debt is by being profitable that's the only way you can get out of debt most people say I have to first eradicate my debt before it can be profitable and that's not true the only way to pay off debt is to have profit. Because debt is an expense you incurred in the past that you couldn't afford or decide not to afford. You borrowed for it. You have to make more money today than you're spending in order to pay back that past expense. That's called profit. So we still do this exact same system. You still allocate money to a profit. We have one exception to their golden rule of celebrate the money. When the profit comes out, if you have debt, we're going to use it to first wipe out debt. But we're going to keep allocating money to a profit so you have a profit habit. And the day your debt is all eradicated, that next check that comes out is a big mamba check to you. So we want to build the profit muscle. But as the money comes out, the, um, the, the money comes out, you hit this first debt as fast as possible. And now you can actually have lunch with your friend again without being embarrassed. <laughs> then you're making a minimum installment of $500 here, right? That's what we said was going on here. Then when the next profit distribution comes out, you, you hammer this and this debt gets eradicated. But the snowball starts kicking in, because you were paying $600 before to maintain this debt, but now $500 a month is freed up. We're now paying $1,100 to eradicate this debt. So it actually, it starts getting wiped out on its own faster and faster. That um, profit distribution comes out, we hammer that debt. Now 1100 gets added to the 1000 so we're actually paying 2100 a month. And just by doing this, within one year, it'll eradicate the debt on its own. We don't have to worry about distributions. But when they come out, we hammer it. And now we have 2,000 plus five, we have $7,100 or whatever a month going toward this $200,000 of debt. And this one within two years will be eradicated without a profit distribution. We still hit with profit. And then the day comes, the greatest day, when that debt's ripped up and gone. And then it's like, pff, you're all profit. That's called the debt snowball. So, and I would say, a large majority of this room has some form of debt. Sort it by the amount due, hammer the smallest ones first, and start piling up your momentum on the bigger ones next. Okay, let's do a couple more questions. Uh, yes, sir. Mike, uh, if I remember correctly, you, when you distribute profit, you only distribute 50% in the account, correct? Wow, someone read the book, yes. Okay, and so if you 50% of the account, is the goal not to then take 90% towards debt and 10% towards celebration, correct? Yeah, so that you nailed it. No one else knows what the fuck you just said, by the way. Okay. But you nailed it. I was explaining what you said. So my question is, because then my wife is like, that sucks. Um, <laughs> and, and that's trying to get her to get on board yeah. with that has been tough because we didn't do that the first time. And then I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, you were this debt first, yeah. Yeah, and so she got a, we got a $10,000 profit share check. And then the next one, I'm like, hey, it's only four. And she's like, well, where the heck did money go? Yeah. Um, so is there any behavioral habit that goes with that that you can help? Obviously, start at the beginning, but. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. Um, in, in all seriousness, have her read the book. Yeah. Um, I, I'd love to talk with her yeah. <laughs> without you in the room, because then we get, yeah, she's like, yeah. But, but the, the, 
the biggest change, the biggest shift is a mind shift, is the day we put more significance in saving money than spending money, this whole thing kicks off. So if you can just say, hey, do you want to spend money or do you want to save money, really? And if, if she understands that and she, she's a saver or she wants to save, that's when this will flip. It, yeah, it, it is tough. And, and our, it, because we're so established in our processes that it will, it will kind of hit us over the head a few times. Let me just share the one thing that you talked about, the 50% and 90%, because that's a little bit confusing. I want to show you how we manage the profit account. This is more of an advanced technique. But that profit account, we're going to let money accumulate it. Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll draw it here. So say your first quarter. And I, you can start Monday. The quarter still has about two and a half months left, so start right away. At the end of this quarter, let's just say for round number six, you have $1,000 in that profit hold account. Well, our rule is actually, to your point, is a 50% profit distribution. So half that money, 50%, would come out as a profit distribution. So $500, which means $500 stays in that profit account. This $500, if you have debt, we're going to use 90% of it to pay off the debt. So 90 times 5 is, say, 450, is that right, 450? Yeah. So 450 goes to hit debt, and we still take a portion to celebrate with. This is the one thing, I, I love Dave Ramsey's work. Dave Ramsey says you gotta live the life like no one is willing to live, whatever, or something, to, to, to live a life in the future. Um, he says use every penny you have to use white out debt. I, I found from a behavioral standpoint, we need to get small rewards. So I would just suggest, a minor tweak to be suggesting is take 90%, hit debt, take that 50 bucks left over, and you and wife are going out for maybe not a nice dinner, but maybe a nice lunch, right? And, and, and you celebrate it and say, listen, let, let's, tear, let's tear up a statement together. That's gonna be fun. 500 bucks stays here. Say next quarter you add, say the business is relatively flat, you add another $1,000, which means your revenue was the same because it's the same contribution, but now we have $1,500 in here. Take out 50% of that, that is now 750, and 750 stays. 90% goes to eradicate debt. If you still have it, the remaining now is $75 or whatever goes to you. So you're actually taking out more profit. Next quarter, say $1,000 goes in again, means your business is not growing, it's flat. But even if the business is flat, 50% of that uh, is what, 800, no, 900, 875? Something like that. And 875 stays. What you'll see is the phenomena, it's a mathematical phenomena. Your profit distributions, even with a business that's flat, grows. And your what's called uh, cash equity position, retained earnings, grows. You start becoming, to the earlier question, kind of your own bank. You have a reserve of cash. And I hope every person in this room wants to sell your business one day. Um, people ask me, like, Mike, is that, like, the day you sold your business, like, was that a good day? And I'll be honest, it was not. It was a fucking great day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I wish this upon every single soul. Oh, it's funny. I wish this upon every soul in this room. If you want to sell your business, let's sell it. The more cash you have reserved in your business, your valuation goes up. The more that your business shows that it can create money profitably, your valuation will skyrocket. So drive the system into your business, if for nothing else, just because of the value you'll get when you sell it. And that answers your question. For my own business, uh, I still do the transfer all myself, and I love it. I love it. I, I look up the side of the, the bank account. I'm like, I'm looking at the screen. I'm loving this. I'm like, yeah. Let's do one more question. Um, Mike, I found out about you about six months ago through Shelby. Oh, you were that guy. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got the book. I read it. Yeah, it talks about you know presenting this to a formally trained accountant. Yeah. It's going to turn them on their head. Yeah. Um, my mother-in-law of 27 years is a formally a trained accountant. <laughs> so can you guys I took a question? the book to her and talked to her. Yeah. Now she won't talk to me. Okay, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so here, here, he just pointed out, he discovered the book six months ago, if you didn't hear that. But it works. Uh, I said in the book, if you go to a formally trained accountant, this is going to spin their head because yeah. it, it, it spits in the face of traditional accounting. Smoke came out of her ears. He said his, his formally trained accountant is his mother-in-law. Yeah. Like, that's the ultimate one-two punch. Accountant, <laughs> mother-in-law! <laughs> Well, I'm coming down, yeah. Wow! My mom! Your mom! She's wonderful. <laughs> and she does talk to him. And she won't talk to him now. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but I get it. So, it, it is normal, all kidding aside, it is normal for a traditionally trained accountant or for us to resist this because we've never done this before. It is new and weird. It's awkward. So, just A, accept that. But here's, if you want to get, I wouldn't do this with my mother-in-law, but if you want to, 
if you want to confront an accountant and says, I'm not going to support this, this is, this, is, this is hogwash, this is a shell game. I mean, are you kidding me? All these accounts, the reconciliations. I've heard all the resistance. If you hear that, just ask them, say, well, of all the clients you currently support, tell me, how many of them take quarterly profit distributions currently? And the accountant will say, usually uh, none of them. How, how many of your clients are profitable? What kind of profits do your clients post at the end of the year? 83% or not, so they'll say, mm, basically none of them. And say, well, are you willing to try something with me that may actually turn that process around? And if your accountant says no, I'd question if I'd want to work with that account. In your case, I still would, but. Yeah. 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 But locked you're locked in. Yeah, you're locked in. But she's wonderful. Um, no, I'm kidding. But, but I would just, you can challenge your accountant. Um, just as a final thought, we'll do one more question. The final thought is uh, my company is called Profit, the book is called Profit First. We started an organization called Profit First Professionals. Mark Kudre is one of them. He's a master certified Profit First Professional. He knows his shiitake um, mushrooms. And when it comes to profit, I just don't want to keep swearing all day. And um, there's guys like him, and there's other guys like him that can help you do this process. So if your accountant's resistant to it, just talk with Mark and say, how can we get through this? Maybe Mark can coach you himself. Last question, John, with that baseball cap. Yeah, oh, dude, I love you, man. Yeah. Is there a bookkeeper service we can recommend? Yes. What, what it's called Profit First Professionals. <laughs> so Profit First. Pro <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So Profit First Professionals are accountants, bookkeepers, and business coaches all certified in this method. Guys, it's been a pleasure speaking with such an energetic group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike McCollowitz, everybody. Thank you guys so much for coming to Print Hustles Comp 2019. We'll see you guys next year. There is an unofficial meetup at headquarters in River North at 7 p.m. if you're still around. Se uh, I'm sorry, 7 p.m. headquarters in River North. Have a great rest of the night. Thank you guys.